So today I'll speak on the topic of faith and strength. How do they go together in our life? This 17th chapter, what do I mean by faith and strength? Strength refers to our own ability to do things. And we all need that. And faith refers to the whatever it is beyond us that also shapes our life. So our life is a constant dynamic interaction between our strength and our faith. Now these two are not entirely watertight categories. Because at one level, we can say, I have faith in my strength. Hmm? Or we can say, my faith is my strength also. Hmm? So it's not watertight. But broadly, we're talking about what is in our, something that is in our power, which we're calling as our strength, and something which is not in our power, but which also matters to us, which I'm calling as our faith. So the 17th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita is one of the most neglected and often yet one of the most profound chapters. We often talk about 9th chapter, 12th chapter, these are very sweet devotional chapters. 17th chapter is, it's talking about Shraddha Traya Vibhaga Yoga. That is the three divisions of faith. So what that means is, I don't think we need this or it doesn't take too much power. Okay, we can always connect it again, I think. Okay. It's a little too bright. So, when we talk about faith, broadly speaking, uh, we use the word faith in mostly a religious context. And nowadays the idea is that you have your faith and I have my faith. And people use the word, especially in the Western world, they use a believer. Believer and non-believer. So, when we talk about faith, what are we actually talking about? So we can talk about broadly four categories. If we make it a diagram, uh, maybe I could draw it, but um, if you can envision it also. Say you have no faith, no strength. We have only faith, but no strength. We have strength, but no faith. And we have faith and strength. Let's see. Is it clear or should I draw this? It's clear enough. Okay. So, if you see, uh, when people, for example, sink into depression, that is the state when you have no faith and no strength. So, that is, that we, maybe so many bad things have happened to us in our life, that we start thinking that the world is a terrible place, and we have no faith in the goodness of the world. And similarly, our own efforts to do things have also not worked. Right? They have also not only not worked, sometimes they have backfired. When we do something good and no good comes out of it, that's discouraging. But when we do something good and bad comes out of it, that's not just discouraging, that's devastating. So when something like that happens, then people feel, I have no strength and I have no faith also. That is a state of abject misery. To be in that kind of situation is we need to get out of it as quickly as possible. If we are in that situation, uh, what happens in today's world is actually nobody is without strength. That means everybody has technology now. With technology, we can we have the strength to summon all kinds of information, imagery, ideas from various places. And many I was in actually I was in Australia when there was this this shootings happened in the mosque in Christchurch. In America, some of some of school shootings have become common. They're shocking, but still they're common. In New Zealand, some nothing like that has happened for a long time. I mean, recent memory thing has happened. So it, was, it shocked the whole psyche of the country and not just in New Zealand but also Australia because it's Australian who had gone there and shot. So now when people do something like this actually speaking when we are in that situation of no strength and no faith we just can't stay in that situation for, for long and then we have to somehow as assert our strength. 
Now that asserting of our strength can come if it goes inward, it becomes suicide. It becomes out goes outward, it becomes homicide. It becomes further outward, it becomes genocide. So we cannot stay in a state of complete powerlessness. It's just not possible for us. And when people have to be somewhere in a very, very dark place to assert their strength in such a disastrous way, in such a horrendous way. So we may find a healthy way to come out of that or we'll find an unhealthy way to come out of it. But we can't stay in a state when we feel we have no strength, no power. And suicide is also an act of violence. It's an act of it's an act of strength. Right? Life, you are making my life, you are making me so miserable. I have the power to stop you from making me miserable. And that is by ending my life. Now, of course, it doesn't end the misery. Because we are souls, and the soul based on its karma has to go to the next life. But the point is that at that situation, when we have no faith and no strength, we just can't stay there. And we have to escape from it some way or the other. So from no strength, no faith. So we can go toward strength, but no faith. <clears throat> so even strength, but no faith means, like I said, somebody has homicide. Like world is terrible. If I am so miserable, who is the cause of my misery? I will remove them from the world. Or it may be if I am miserable, I will make sure that others are also miserable. <laughs> so there are of course various ways in which we can go from that no faith, no strength to no faith but strength. And in many ways science and technology has expanded those ways. Has expanded those ways means that now through technology we can cause destruction but apart from destruction, we can also have escapism. Escapism can be through just internet surfing, through drugs, through alcoholism, through entertainment, through spectator sports. The kind of mania that is associated with sports today, it is uh, incredible. Entertainment has always been a part of human society, but it's maniac today. People spend millions and millions. I was in Australia, and at that time, the, the Cricket World Cup was going on. So, one of my friends, he had gone to England. Uh, he had been there for several days, so there was an India-Pakistan match. And at that time, there was some fear that rain may wipe out the match. So he had bought the India-Pakistan match ticket for 1,500 pounds. One ticket. 1,500 pounds is almost like 2 lakh rupees. <laughs> you know, one ticket. <laughs> so he called me and he says, you know, I don't believe in God, but if there is a God, can you pray to him that there be no rains? <laughs> <laughs> Not even that India will, at least the match go on. <laughs> <laughs> because the ICC rules are that if even one ball is bold, then they don't refund, refund anything. If no balls are bold, then they refund the money. But what had happened? He had bought the ticket in black. So he would not get any refund. <laughs> or no meaningful refund. So anyway, what happens is that this obsession, how much money people are just spending for one match, that's because they want to escape from life. And we all need some sense of power. So, losing ourselves in entertainment, identifying with our heroes, and thinking that in the greatness of our heroes lies our greatness. Hmm? That is also one way of escaping. Hmm? In a movie, suppose a, you know, a hero and heroine are hugging and kissing, people start whistling. Why is that? Because they are thinking, if only I was there, it would be so nice. They are identifying. It's called vicarious pleasures. So basically, that's how we try to gain some power. 
so we this is second quadrant i'll come back to this quadrant a little later mm. what is the third quadrant faith but no strength faith but no strength now we may say how uh, if if we if you talk about isn't faith also a strength can there be somebody who has faith but no strength yes it's possible in fact there are many people who are weak minded they are they use religion as a crutch so as it says god helps those who help themselves but if somebody is not ready to help themselves and they think god will take care of all things for them that is actually escapism through religion so of course some people are stronger some people are weaker now most of most of you say who have come to america it's it's of course your hard work but it's not just your hard work every one of you if you want to take a materialistic world view every of one of you won a big genetic lottery at birth and to the large extent at birth itself our iq is determined and in at least in our education system especially with its field like software the iq that you have that is critical in shaping our future life trajectory iq alone is not decisive but iq is significant so we could say somebody has a very poor iq so they just can't do even basic things they just can't it's processing it becomes too much for them then we can say they have no strength it's one intellectual strength we could say but somebody has no strength so if somebody now even in that situation we have to find out what strengths we have and work on them but if somebody is are thinking of faith as a substitute for one strength it is not a substitute it is a complement it is not a replacement but a complement my strength may be 1% and my faith may be 99% or my faith may be 50 my strength may be 50% my faith may be 50% Now, while functioning in the world, we have while we are doing our part, we have to act as if everything depends on us. Because when Arjuna was shooting the arrows at the opponents, he was not thinking, you know, Krishna will make sure the arrows hit the target. Mm-hmm. He was aiming carefully, using his full strength to make sure that they hit the target. Now, a question. So, when we talk about uh, no strength. Yeah, here, here we are talking about either they have no 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 abilities, intellectual abilities, physical abilities, or if the strength is also in terms of willpower. Okay, if somebody doesn't use whatever willpower they have, it may be little or more, and they think God will take care of everything, then that is also a kind of escapism. So just as there can be escapism into some kind of illusory strength, like escapist entertainment, so religion can also become an escapism. and when karl marx said that religion is the opium of the masses he was right but he was not completely right he was right with respect to some people the marx idea was that that the upper class people just like in india we had the caste system in the west also they had similar almost four tier there was the clergy then there was the royalty then there were the bourgeois there were then there were the the landlords and then there were the serfs so like brahman chatriya vaishya shudra so he he felt that the lower the lowest classes the la- now these classes were not so much uh, they were financial classes largely but they were also by heritage so somebody was born in royalty was automatically considered to be royalty somebody was born as a peasant or a serf they were already considered like that only so he felt that really thought that religion is a tool by which the upper classes maintain their privilege and power and and the lower classes they paralyze them into not striving to improve their lives by promising them that your next life will be better so now oh, the idea is that so you just do what you are supposed to do so you live in poverty and you die in poverty you work hard and still you live throughout the poverty and then you die in poverty so in the medieval world view 
but there was practically no what we would call today as upward mobility one's birth would more or less determine one's trajectory throughout life and did people not have strength not everyone but some people did become passive and there are always cynical people even who can use religion as a tool now not that every all religion is do that but it is been done so religion can be used as a tool by the powerful to keep the low people low so he said that oh people have to give up this hope of some other world where they will be happy and they have to fight to make themselves happy in this world so when somebody because of their religion it becomes completely passive if we look at our epics the mahabharat the ramayan the heroes are not passive they are resourceful they are talented they are charismatic and they so they have faith but it's not just faith they also have strength so if somebody it takes faith in god as a replacement for one's own efforts replacement for discovering one's own strengths and developing those strengths then that is unhealthy then the fourth category will be what will it be faith and strength so that is the best situation to be in if we see in 13 1133 in the krishna krishna says in the bhagavad gita tasmat tamuttishta yasho labhasva jitva shatrun bhum swarajyam samriddham mayai vaite nihatah purvameva nimitta matram bhavasau vyasachi so he says nimitta matram bhavasau vyasachi at one level he is acknowledging arjuna's ability when he says you are sau vyasachi you are expert archer so arjuna is so expert that he is ambidextrous he can fight equally well with both with arrow in both hands so he is expert archer and he is saying your perfection is that you become an instrument for him at one level we can say that krishna can use anyone as an instrument that's true that is uh, that krishna can make even an unworthy instrument worthy but at the same time krishna is also here to do some serious work dharma samsthapana arthaya sambhavami yoga yoga now to establish dharma in the world is not a easy task so for doing that krishna needs competent instruments and a devotee's mood is at one level there is dependence on krishna that's faith but at another level there is also diligence for krishna we want to do our work the best way that we can and so we need to be in this category of we have to find out our strengths and we serve krishna according to our strengths and with this in this strengths we don't have to too much differentiate between what is material and spiritual because ultimately everything comes from krishna so if somebody has some material abilities they can also be used to maybe directly serve krishna if they are usable or to indirectly serve krishna to indirectly serve krishna means that say if we have some technical skills you have software skills then use that to grow in life so that you have a respectable position and in that with that respectable position then we can attract more many more people to krishna so in this fourth category it is it is that our devotion to krishna is meant to be life affirming not life denying life affirming means that when we serve krishna actually we live life fully we use all our abilities material and spiritual in a constructive way life denying means you focus on oh i'm not meant to do this i'm not meant to do that i'm not meant to do that bhakti is not so much about what we are meant not to do it is about what we are meant to do we focus primarily on the yes not on the no yes we are, there are certain things which we are meant to say no to but the essence of bhakti is 
very serious to me. Wow. And a devotee usually becomes so busy in saying yes to Krishna that a devotee doesn't even notice that I'm saying no to other things. That's the state of absorption in Krishna. Now, as I said, if you consider the example of Arjuna, I'll take two examples and I'll conclude and then we can have some questions. So, if you consider Arjuna, he, at one, the epics can be understood at different levels. At one level, we know he's an eternal associate of the Lord and he is also come as a part of the Lord Kila. But in the manifest pastimes, in the Mahabharata, it's not depicted like that. It's actually at the Draupadi Swayamba that Arjuna and Krishna meet for the first time. Where Krishna comes and introduces himself. He says, I'm Krishna. And the Pandavas heard about him a lot. They're delighted to meet him. So at that time, Arjuna did not know that he was going to be an, he was going to fight a Dharma Yuddha for Krishna. He was a Kshatriya and he wanted to be the best Kshatriya that he could be. And he saw that he was good in archery and he worked diligently. It's interesting that we often tell this incident when Arjuna saw or then all of them were asked to shoot at a target. And Drona said, look at the, what do you see? Someone said, oh, I see the branch. Someone said, I see the tree. Someone said, I see the bird. Now, Arjuna came and what did Arjuna say? I see only the eye of the bird. Now, it's interesting. He didn't see, I see Krishna over there. <laughs> now, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita in 6.30, Yo maam pashyati sarvatra sarvam chamai pashyati That is the one who sees me everywhere and sees everything in me. Tasya hum na pranashyami tachame na pranashyati That uh, they are never lost to me and I am never lost to them. Now, that is true. When a devotee, when they have to function, a devotee has to function in the world, then they have to function effectively in the world. And we have to do the best for Krishna. So, if uh, if some work needs to be done, we need to see how that work needs to be done. We can't just have a transcendental vision that makes us dysfunctional in the world. And uh, when the devotees had arranged a big Rathyatra in, in London, the first Rathyatra, the devotees had done something in San Francisco and the London devotees thought we'll do bigger. So they made a bigger card, but they keep the, kept the wheels the same size. And then at the time of Rath Yatra, just the whole Rath crumbled. The wheel itself crumbled. It was, a pump. it was a PR disaster. And the devotees were so despondent. They wrote to Prabhupada. And they said, Prabhupada, did the Rath collapse because of our poor devotion? Prabhupada said, it collapsed because of your poor engineering. <laughs> so now Arjuna was wholehearted in developing his strength. His archery was his strength, and he was diligent. When he had to shoot the target, he saw only the target. And that's how he developed his ability. And later on, the opportunity came that is Dharma Yuddha, and he used his ability for it. If we see similarly, Shri Prabhupada. Shri Prabhupada, for most of his life, he was trying to run a business. And although at one level he was not, the business was not very successful, Prabhupada traveled a lot, met a lot of people, interacted with them. And Prabhupada learned from all that experience. When Prabhupada went to the West, Prabhupada was pure, but he was not naive. He knew how the world worked. So it was, if you see, when Prabhupada came with his disciples uh, to India, at that time, at one level, his disciples had been extremely materialistic. They had um, done all kinds of things. And Prabhupada had throughout lived a pure life. But when Mr. N tried to, che tried to cheat the devotees, it was not that Prabhupada was so transcendental that Prabhupada also got cheated. Actually, Prabhupada was very resourceful and it required a lot of material planning. Prabhupada didn't say when Mr. N was trying to steal the land away, he took the money and he was sending uh, sending hooligans to try to drive the devotees away from there. 
Now, Prabhupada did not say, let's chant Hare Krishna and Krishna will take care of everything. Hmm. Prabhupada strategized. Prabhupada had the devotees go and meet influential people. And Prabhupada strategized means, Prabhupada, see, when required in, in the Western world, Prabhupada said, we are not Hindus. Because we are transcendental. But there he went and he had his disciples meet the meet the various politicians, very influential decisions. He says, now this is the first Hindu temple in India that is built, built primarily by Americans. And this is being destroyed. What will be the what will happen in the name of India all over the world? So he used both Hinduism and nationalism. And people just became erupted. And they thought that the opponents, Mr. Stan and this group thought that they are just dealing with a bunch of naive foreigners. But they didn't know how, how strategic Prabhupada could be. And like, it's just one day, the devotees went and they met some influential people. They called uh, some journalists. And the next day, in all the newspapers, Hindu temple is being destroyed. And the whole mood changed with this, which flip within just a few hours. And Mr. N just had to, Mr. N, and he was so traumatized that he just got a heart attack and he died. And then his, his wife tried to fight on, but she also, then she came and fell at Prabhupada's feet. And Prabhupada, she said, Prabhupada, please forgive me. And Prabhupada was not vindictive at that. He would come back, he said, you're just like my daughter, I'll take care of you. So, Prabhupada fought when he was required, when it was required. See, we may have to fight against someone, but we don't have to be against someone. We have to fight because that's what is required for our service. But Prabhupada was not inimical. He was not uh, vengeful. So Prabhupada had his strengths and he used those strengths. He, he had some strengths and he leveraged, got other strengths. So faith in Krishna is not a substitute for our own strength. Is both faith and strength go together in our service to Krishna. And for all of us, at one level when we practice bhakti, we study the philosophy, we chant the holy names, we see devotees across the world, and we often from the from the past times in scripture as well as in the as well as the lives of devotees, we often see how Krishna works in extraordinary ways to arrange things wonderfully for us, devotees. So we strengthen our faith in Krishna. So that for the things that are beyond our control, we uh, we have faith that Krishna will take care. Even if they are difficult, Krishna will bring something good out of it. But while doing that, while developing our faith, we also need to develop our strength. So whatever it is, if we are, we are doing, okay, how I am doing this service for Krishna, how can I serve Krishna more in future? And we need to have uh, as I said, bhakti is life affirming. We need to, within the service of Krishna, each of us, Prabhupada, uh, Prabhupada wanted every one of his followers to become spiritual masters. Not as a Miksha Gurus, but spiritual master means Yara Dekha Tarekho, Krishna Upadesh. So you want everyone to share Krishna's message. So whatever is the strength that we have, we can use it to try to become instruments in the mission of compassion. And when we are situated in that in that quadrant of strength and faith, then we will find that bhakti is to sukham karkam avalokam. It is joyful. It is something which is uh, where we are engaged in something meaningful. We are able to make some some contribution to the world. So we get sublime joy, not just through our internal connection with Krishna, but also through our external contribution for Krishna. And that is the example that the Bhagavad Gita demo calls Arjuna to demonstrate when it tells Arjuna fight. And that is the example which Shri Prabhupada also demonstrates. So I'll summarize. So I spoke today on this theme of you know, how strength and faith go together in Bhakti. So I talked about the 17th chapter of the Gita where Krishna says that we all Everybody in the three modes has everybody has their faith and their life is shaped according to their faith. So I talked about how these two categories, strength and faith, are not necessarily watertight. But strength we refer to 
our capacities to change the things that are in our control. And faith refers to our understanding that that which is not in our control will ultimately work out for good. So we talked about the four categories. What is the first? No faith, no strength. That is depression and it's unbearable. We have to assert strength somehow. It may be destructive, like suicide, homicide, genocide, or it can be escapist through technology, through drugs, through, through uh, sports, or through spectator sports. So we go towards some place of strength but no faith. But whatever we do in this category, it's, it's ultimately unfulfilling. Because no matter how much strength we develop, eventually our strength is going to run out. And then if we have no faith, we will just be crushed by life. Then third category is faith but no strength. And so that is where people treat religion as a as, a, as an escapism. as where religion becomes the opium of the masses. That people see faith as a replacement for their strength rather than a complement. So if we don't do our part and think let God take care of everything, that kind of passivity is irresponsible. That is not spirituality. And such people often are uh, they give a bad name to religion. They're exploited by others who use the name of religion, uh, who in, incite their religious passions. And they, and then atheists and skeptics use these as an example of how religion is disrupted, like Karl Marx did. But <clears throat> the idea is that if you look at our tradition, the, the most illustrious models are the fourth category of strength and faith. Mm. So we have been given certain abilities and bhakti is meant to be life affirming. That we use our abilities to live fully in a mood of service to Krishna. I took two examples. One of Arjuna, how he was not just seeing Krishna everywhere. Yes, he was devoted to Krishna, but when he had to shoot archery, shoot, he saw his target and focused on that target. So he developed his strength fully. Shri Prabhupada even when he was directly serving Krishna by building a temple for Krishna, he leveraged his strength when there was a threat that the temple may be defrauded and may be stolen away. So when the Juhu temple was to be got. So Prabhupada fought for Krishna. And all of us, when we do, we develop our faith by, the, by, the, by engaging in the limbs of bhakti, by hearing, reading, chanting. But it, we also observe ourselves and develop our strengths. And when we have this combination of strength and faith, then our bhakti will be joyfully performed. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Any questions or comments? Yes, Prabhu. Hare So how do we know what's the line between when we just get, get ourselves completely into spiritual life or when we get ourselves completely into an our, our professional or material life? We need to see all aspects of our life as meant for Krishna. It's not just what I do in the temple, that is for Krishna. And what I do in my uh, job, that is just mundane. Bhutanam Yena Sarvamidam Tatam Swakarmanatam Abhyarcha Siddhim Vindati Bhanava 
the 18th chapter sri rakta what is labyrinth 46 47 48 verses he says his famous words swakarmana tamakthirchi some people translate it as work is worship what krishna is actually saying is work as worship work in a mood of worship and how can we work in a mood of worship he says that that i that all of existence has come from me yatah pravrtir bhutana and yena sarvamidam tatam god is not just the source of everything god is the pervader of everything so whatever we are doing in the world actually the energies with which we are working they are also energies of god the talents we are using are also talents given to us by god so there are some connections with krishna which are more direct some which are more indirect but we need to see that all of them these are connecting us with krishna when we have this attitude that these are all various ways in which i connect with krishna then we will be able to move forward constructively so there are times when the direct connection is the opportunities are a lot and we need to use them whole heartedly so for example festivals are there or some some new devotees have come and we are very inspired by their festival we just do just do it whole heartedly just do as much as is required but we, that doesn't mean that that will become the norm there are, that 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 is not the norm the norm is that we have to have a balance but the nature of balance is that it's not static it's not one formula that we can implement but it is rather if you keep your purpose in mind that okay i i want to do this also and i want to do this also sometimes i'll do this more sometimes i'll do that more so it is purpose that provides perspective so if our purpose is to think that oh, i only want to go spiritual and not material or i only want to go material and not spiritual but if you understand both of these are like lanes in our life and we need to go on both lanes uh, then or you could say like the two tracks for us so we are souls but we are presently in physical bodies so although ultimately we are spiritual beings right now we are body mind body and soul together so you could say our material life and spiritual life are like two train two tracks of a train if we go only on spiritual life and like getting on a train on one track even those who are renounced but they also have to take care of their health they have to take care of their uh, material needs it may be lesser much lesser but then they everybody has to take care of that so the tendency is that if some people go on the one track of material life alone then also that's not a very sustainable track that also leads to lack of fulfillment that also leads to frustration that leads to if there's no ultimate meaning in life then our mind can just eat us up so we need both aspects of our life and if we have that purpose clear that both are meant to connect me with krishna now it's not automatically that the two will be tracks of uh, the two will be like two tracks of a train if our material life is filled with gross sensuality and uh, and in mode of ignorance kind of activities then the two, it's like two tracks already diverge so we have to make sure that the two tracks go together it's not automatically they will go together does that answer your question yeah Okay. <laughs> okay. So. Yes, sir. <laughs> okay. So. Do we have if our material life, the professional also went for Krishna? Then do we really have two tracks? Why say that it's material life and spiritual life? Okay. No. It's it can be a contradiction, but it needn't be. as there is uh there is a transcendental way of looking at things and there is a functional way of looking at things mm-hmm. so suppose somebody says that my whole family is devotees so 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 you know i will, i don't need to give a charity for krishna because you know i'm giving charity to my family well <laughs> that is not really charity is it it's your family of course we have to take care of family needs but 
or for that matter, they have talked with many devotees, even very senior devotees, both husband and wife are like 20, 30, 40 years practicing bhakti, and the children are also very dedicated devotees. But still they tell me that you know, when we associate with each other, we don't see each other for first as devotees. It's a functional relationship comes up. So it is devotee association, but it is not just devotee association. So we also need association of other devotees with whom we are relating primarily as devotees, not primarily as family members. Because when your family members, then the functional roles come into the picture. It's good, it's it's best if our family members are also devotees. But somebody says, oh, my family is devotees, so why do I need to go to a temple? No, that will not work. We need devotee association. So at a, at a transcendental level, we can say that actually our whole life is spiritual. But at a functional level, it's a matter of our consciousness and we have to see what activities spiritualize our consciousness more and what activities despiritualize our, our consciousness or maybe they don't spiritualize our consciousness that much. And that, that discernment is required even while doing devotional activities. Say, for example, if while doing book distribution, if somebody goes into a, some other day, the devotees, at one time they went to a, in the early days, they would go to a places where people were completely drunk. They went to a place where people were totally like, uh, they were unclothed. And then they were going to such places and then Prabhupada came to know about it. Prabhupada also went once or twice to that place. They always took him there. And, and then Prabhupada said, no, we have to think whether people are going to become devotees or not. If you go to those places, at least there's a possibility of becoming devotees. Uh, in that famous Avalon ballroom where Prabhupada did the mantra rocket dance, Prabhupada said that this is no place for a brahmacharya to be there. One of his disciples was practicing brahmacharya. He said, this is no place for a brahmacharya. So we have to also, there are certain places, even while performing bhakti, which can uh, which can affect our consciousness adversely. So we could say at, at a transcendental level, everything is spiritual. But at a functional level, how much what spiritualizes our consciousness, we need to differentiate that. Definitely, if you go to a temple, it will spiritualize our consciousness much more than if you go to our job. So we need to have that differentiation. And, and that functional sense, we are talking about material life and spiritual life. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is it possible that say in we may imitate our spiritual, we may become obsessed with our spiritual heroes and become manic? Yeah. Prabhupada told us that if you try to live like the six Goswamis, you will die. We just can't do that. Mm. And many Prabhupada disciples who tried to stretch their bodies sleeping for a few hours and now many of them say you need to take care of your health they say that we stretched ourselves and they don't regret that but they say that we can't serve krishna as much now uh, as we could have see ultimately we can't cheat the body the body can cheat us but we can't cheat the body <laughs> the body can cheat us means that the body can make us sleep more than we need to do the body can make us eat more than we need to do. The body can make us indulge more than we need to do. By making us believe, actually you need to do this. But we can't cheat the body. That means if we don't give the body what it needs, if we don't give it enough sleep, so what happens? Now, if we don't sleep at the right time, then we sleep at the wrong time. <laughs> we sleep during class, we sleep during japa. We sleep at so many other times. So what happens is we can't cheat the body. So we have to take care of the body. And uh, it is important that we recognize that that's why there's anukaran and there's anusaran. There's imitating and following. So we are not going to imitate the great souls. We are going to follow in their footsteps. Following the footsteps means that we see what is our capacity 
and we do the best according to our capacity. Uh, we can certainly take inspiration from others, and there's always the possibility that we can do more, we can dedicate ourselves more. But after a few years, we start realizing that every one of us is so different that that comparison just doesn't uh, make much functional sense. So we have to act according to our level. And of course, we try to improve our level. So where I was, how much scriptural knowledge I had six months ago, now I should have more. How much scriptural realization I had six months ago, I should have more. How much, say, devotional abilities or experiences or devotional skills I have, I should have increased that. But we need to focus on where we are and taking steps forward uh, with the inspiration of others. Not that we think that we can take the same size steps that they are taking. Does that answer your question? Yes. Uh, thank you so much for, for the wonderful lecture. Uh, so I had a doubt like uh, in, in today's time, like several times our faith gets challenged both internally as well as externally. So how would we respond to that in terms of do we stand up and fight against those factors or do we just ignore and block them out? Can you give an example of what you mean by faith getting challenged? Uh, like sometimes doubts might uh, come into my mind like uh, in terms of uh, is what I'm doing correct or is, is that the thing I, I should follow? If some, as an external factor, somebody else might question that uh, you're following this, uh, how right or how wrong can you be? So it's like when those kind of factors come in, how should we respond? Like should we just ignore them or should we know we should try to defend what mm -hmm. kind of, like what? Following. Yeah. So, if our faith is attacked either internally or externally, what should we do? Well, for the, the, both of them, it's different. If there are internal doubts that are coming, definitely we need to deal with them. We will go to some devotees who know that subject. We also have to learn which devotees can address what kind of doubts. If we are analytical, then we need the association of someone who is analytical. Um, if we are more culturally oriented, then we need the association of someone who is culturally oriented. So basically, we need spiritual guides, we need spiritual mentors who understand our mind and who help us to understand our mind. Understand our mind, sometimes we ask some question, and we say, why do you think so much? Chant Hare Krishna. Now it's not that I am thinking too much. That's the way my mind thinks. And so somebody has to understand my mind. And then, of course, our mind doesn't always think right. It may reason, it may analyze. So sometimes it may analyze wrongly. Okay, this is how your mind is thinking. But this is where it's going wrong. They help us understand how our mind works. So we need, that's why Rupa Goswami says, Sajati Asha Bhagavad Bhakti Samadhi. A like-minded association. So we need some devotees like that who can who won't judge us for our doubts, but will help us to deal with our doubts. So if internal doubts are coming, then uh, we need that kind of association. And it needn't be that that association is immediately available. And sometimes some doubts have to be kept in, in suspension, with old judgment. It's that, say, what happens is sometimes we doubt our beliefs and we believe our doubts. <laughs> it's okay, it's the doubt. But maybe I can doubt my doubt also, isn't it? Maybe the doubt is not the complete picture. Yes, there are some questions raised about it. It's uh, okay, I can hold them for some time. It's not that I have to just, just because the doubt has come, that means the whole foundation of my bhakti, I'll have to give my own practice of bhakti or something like that. So that's one thing. But we need like my if internal doubts are coming, we need like my association. And also there are there's a difference between what is called as so head doubts and heart doubts. Head doubts are more intellectual. That uh, okay, the Bhagavatam describes this mountain is so big. How can something be so big? Uh, there is a physical dimension. Prabhupada was very uh Prabhupada did not consider he gave those figures, but he didn't consider that very important. In the first canto, Prabhupada says at one place that Krishna has left Hastinapur and come to Dwarka. And then the part by which Krishna has come is described in the Bhagavatam. 
into this city, this province, this city, like that. And Prabhupada says some historians, some uh, they may try to retrace the path by which Krishna came. But the geology, the surface of the earth keeps changing. And tracing Krishna's path is quite difficult. As far as we are concerned, we are simply satisfied that Krishna has come to Dwarka and we want to perform pastime with his devotees. <laughs> See, the Bhagavatam is not meant to be a book on geography. It has geographical knowledge. But it's not meant to be a book on geography. So these kind of details, they're not that important. And somebody specific interest can study them, but that kind of head doubts. We can say, okay, this is, this is. We look at what is the purpose of the Bhagavatam itself. Is it to give Shukadev Goswami geographical knowledge? No. So we study scripture to to pursue the purpose that was pursued by the original students of the scripture. So head doubts are simply about facts and figures, which are important, but they are not the primary purpose of we study scripture. We study scripture to remember Krishna and to increase our devotion to Krishna. So the hard doubt definitely have to be addressed. Head doubts can be kept in suspension. And then if others ask questions, then we have to see what kind of people they are. If they have genuine questions, then we try to answer them or we try to get the answers. But some people are just, they are out to criticize. And that is happening, whatever reasons we give, it's like, I saw a cartoon once. Whatever you say, I disagree with you. <laughs> <laughs> so, if some people are like that, then let's to keep a distance from them. We shouldn't, one of the keys in having healthy relationship is, don't overvalue people who devalue you. So, if somebody keeps devaluing our faith, then don't overvalue their idea. Keep a distance from them. And we should value those who value us. Does that answer your question? Yeah. You mentioned you said the example of a Rishi Kalipa. He um, had faith as well as he knew his strength to fight against the land or against the prophet. But in Mahabharata, it's also he, that example comes from faith and faith or strength of that. Uh, in Mahabharata, there is also another example of Draupadi, where she surrendered, she had complete faith, and when she was applying her full strength, that time Krishna didn't say, like this example can fall into faith and no strength or run. Mm -hmm. So Krishna didn't help her because she was completely applying her strength. Krishna helped her mm -hmm. when she actually gave up and she completely surrendered to Krishna's full faith. Okay. Like, how do we understand yeah. this? See, this is that Krishna didn't help Draupadi till she gave up her own efforts and yeah. surrendered wholly, wholeheartedly. There are different modes of surrender. Somehow, I have heard this example given by devotees that, yeah, that, and I have never heard seen a Shastrik Praman for this. See, Krishna was there from the beginning. As long as Krishna was, though she was holding, Krishna didn't help. Only when she let go and called, then Krishna helped. Well, that is a, you could use it for conveying a particular point that we have to wholeheartedly depend on Krishna. But it's, it's situational also. Is it that Draupadi was not surrendered to Krishna before that? Was it she was surrendered only at that time? No. If you see at that time, even when she had been called in a single cloth to the assembly, she was not just crying in distress. She was crying, but she was still reminding everyone of Dharma. She was telling that is this Dharma to bring a lady like this? And if, if, if Vishnu had gambled himself, then how could he have gambled? Was he my, was he my master when he could gamble? If he was not his own master. So, the whole assembly was going on the path of Adharma and she was trying to stop that. So she was remembering the principles of Dharma even then. And, and Bhishma actually applauded her. Bhishma said that, he, that he, even amid such adversity that you are remembering Dharma and reminding others of Dharma is laudable. So it's not that only then she surrendered and before that uh, she was not surrendered. It is that we all have to 
to do the best that we can. A, we all have certain area of control and certain things, many things are out of our control. Now this kshetra of ours, that is not static. It keeps changing. Sometimes the area over which we have control is a lot. Sometimes the area over which we have control is very little. With whatever area we have control over, we use that control for Krishna. And if that is a lot, we lose all of it. If that is very little, that's what we lose. And sometimes, we will have no control. Like Arjuna, on the day when, 14th day when he was going to bring down Jayadratha, he fought to the fullest capacity. And he came, he could see the standard of Jayadratha chariot. But then suddenly, eight Kshatriya warriors just charged upon him. And he just couldn't even see anything, couldn't even move forward. The sun was rapidly sinking toward the horizon. And he was so close, he looked so far. He had tried his best and he couldn't do anything. That's when Krishna miraculously intervened. So we do our best. And then when we can't do it, what when we do our best, then Krishna does the rest. Now, even in this case, Draupadi, she did call out to Krishna wholeheartedly. That was also her endeavor. That was also her strength. With all her strength, she called out to Krishna. Many times when we have Kirtan, we say, call out loudly to Krishna. That also requires truth. So is it that when we give up our efforts that Krishna takes over? There are times that happens. But that is not the only way things happen. There is, Prabhupada also talks about this, that when he was in Tompkins Square Park, he had, he had tried so much and nothing was moving forward. He was thinking maybe I just have to go back to India. And he said he just started. He just started a kirtan, closed his eyes. He was also said, be comfortable. Seems to be comfortable, man. So, Prabhupada said, I closed my eyes. I just started singing and singing and singing and singing. And then I opened my eyes and I saw so many people were dancing. So he said, Krishna did that magic. Now, does that mean that Prabhupada didn't do anything? Prabhupada also did. So basically, if there are situation, uh, situations when we can do something, then we are meant to do that. In the situation we can't do anything, then we just offer our consciousness to Krishna. Our consciousness is always to be offered to Krishna. But sometimes it's only our consciousness. It's our, our other times it's our consciousness along with our circumstances. We should try to make them as favorable for Krishna's service as possible. So it's dynamic. It's not that. So that's why I say that surrender has two different modes. There is dependence on Krishna as exemplified by Draupadi, and there is diligence for Krishna, as is exemplified by Arjuna when he picks up his bow in readiness to fight. So for the things that are in our control, there is diligence for Krishna. For the things that are not in our control, there is a dependence on Krishna. So both the orders are still favorable, provided to apply your strength properly. Full strength. Both the quadrants speak which ones? Like full strength and Faith and the third order is no strength and faith. And no strength, but after we complete the good path, right? But so I, I wouldn't call that as no strength mm -hmm. because even then we are using whatever strength we have to offer our consciousness, and offering our consciousness to Krishna is not easy. Mm -hmm. Like basically, no strength and faith means I just do nothing at all, mm -hmm. and I think God will do everything. It's it's. Okay, let me take a more specific example of what I mean by this. In the Bible, there is a story of Jesus' temptations. Jesus was fasting on a mountain cave and Satan came over there, the devil came over there. And he said, you are teaching all this about God to people and you say God is always protecting. He says, yes, of course. Okay, just jump down this mountain. Let us see if your God protects you. Jesus said, I will not jump down this mountain. 
If you push me down, God will put me. But I will not make God myself. So the idea is, he was able to make religion. So now, if he had been pushed down, then it's different. So we have the example of Prahalad. He was just a five-year-old boy. He just couldn't do anything. He just closed his eyes and Krishna protected him. But we also have the example of Arjuna. Swair Dorbhir Asyan Adharma. The Bhagavatam says that sometimes Krishna destroys the demons by his own hands and sometimes Krishna destroys by others' hands. So we have to use our strength, our intelligence to do our best. And when, the, when our best is sometimes just nothing because there's nothing we can do, then we leave it entirely to Krishna. There's a, this idea of world rejecting kind of spirituality. I just leave everything to Krishna. This is a, this is a, a caricature of life. If it is if it is not done very carefully. There can be devotees who have that consciousness and they surrender everything to Krishna. And often in religious literature, these kind of stories are talked about. But that is that is a model for extraordinary level of dependence on Krishna. But that is not the standard for everyone. Like we may have stories with the great saint like Tukaram Maharaj who just do bhajan and then people would come and give food. That's true. That that's Krishna can do that. Krishna has done that. But generations and generations of kings and Brahmins. The number of Brahmins says that I'll just sit and Krishna will give me a memorization of all the Gita words. I have to sit and memorize. I have to sit and learn the rituals. The idea that I depend on Krishna doesn't mean that we don't endeavor. If if Vyasadeva had not endeavored, how would he have written the Mahabharata? Because they do it. <coughs> and last question. Okay. So if Tukaram Maharaj is uh, just absorbed in Bhajan. There's a story of how he was told to guard a field and he got so lost in just reciting the glories of the Lord that he forgot to guard. And then people came and stole, or animals broke in and stole something, everything. But then the Lord arranged for everything to be showered. So there, the Lord can in, intervene miraculously also. And in that case, so the point here is, okay, Let's, let me phrase it in a more precise way. A devotee doesn't deliberately neglect one's responsibilities. Mm. A devotee doesn't deliberately neglect one's strengths in the name of devotion. Mm. Sometimes we just get so absorbed in devotion that we forget everything else. Mm. And that is the ecstasy. That's, that's that's possible and that's wonderful when it happens. You know, there are cases there in the Bhagavatam also Jiva Goswami says that some usually the pastimes of Krishna are described chronologically. But then he says actually this pastime happened after this pastime. He gives various evidence for that. And then he says that because uh, Shukdev Goswami has gone to great ecstasy. So that ecstasy now he's, for, he's not really speaking chronologically. But most of the Bhagavatam is chronological. So when that happens, sometimes a devotee becomes so lost that the devotee just doesn't do anything. And that is considered a bhushana, not a dhushana. Bhushana is an ornament. And um, a dhushana is like contamination. So if we... Okay, uh, let's put it another way. There is material respons responsibility there is material responsibility and there is spiritual responsibility. Sometimes somebody might be so caught in spiritual responsibility that they may neglect their material responsibility. He gets so like Tukaram gets so absorbed in remembering Krishna that he forgets his material responsibility. 
but most people they are not that absorbed so what happens is they will simply sink over here mm -hmm. they will go to a material responsibility so that's what i'm talking about it's possible of course that somebody can transcend and there are glorious examples another way we could say it is that there are uttam adhikaris who at such a level they see everyone as a devotee so what is the need to preach some people are serving krishna directly some people are serving krishna through maya so everybody is <laughs> prabhupada serving krishna book that everybody is dancing in ras leela some people are dancing under yoga maya and some people are dancing under maha maya <laughs> so there is a pure male female attraction and there is a there is a perverted male female attraction but everybody is dancing so but the uttam adhikari the topmost devotee cannot preach so uttam adhikari is just see that everybody is devotee so even if somebody is a uttama they come down to the level of madhyam they come down to the level of middle middle level where they see differences okay this is a this is a devotee this is a seeker this is a this is a envious person and they act accordingly so yes somebody sometimes we can be at a transcendental level but functioning in the world we have to function at a level of uh, which is which is effective in this world also okay and last last question ma'am so uh, it's not the world uh, somebody who doesn't have a religion faith or doesn't have the faith what is what are the factors somebody can सटल इंडिकेशन एंड क्लास so it's tough sometimes it's karma that by which our strengths are taken away from us we have certain abilities we may lose and we might lose our wealth you know people may turn against us but along with that it could be our own not just past karma but it could be our present mistakes also sometimes when we get strength we might just become so arrogant that we alienate everyone else and then when our strengths go away and we have driven everyone else away already then we are just powerless and friendless at that time so we have to we have to that's why when we are successful also we need to respect others and one says amanina manadena when we are successful it is very difficult to not to not become proud but the easiest way to stay humble is by offering respect to others yes i may be more successful than you but you are also you are also part of krishna you are also doing what you can what you can and i respect you for it so if we respect and appreciate people even when we are successful even when we have strengths when the strengths go away those people will be there for us in today's society is extremely isolated at one level it's just because of well, the, the kind of jobs and structure that we have the corporate uh, industry post industrialized society basically ripped people out of their communities and took them far and wide across um, to work for earning and then now with uh, even both members of the family made as working then the people the people whom they are families who spend so much time together so if they uh, people are not that that social bonding is also not there and on top of that our culture has also become very individualistic so at one level economically in the social economy forces itself pull us apart and the ethos has also become very individualistic so you know i am great i will do it myself so because of all those factors the 
when difficulties come, when basically our strengths go away. Nowadays, more and more people in the study of sociology are talking about not only economic capital, but there's also social capital. Social capital is the kind of connections you have in society. And if people, if they, if people don't have enough social capital, then their quality of life goes down enormously. So that also is something which we have to consider. We have to maintain our friends. If we alienate everyone else, thinking that everyone needs me, I don't need anyone. And then we look down upon them, then it will be a big problem. Another thing could be that when we go through those difficulties, it's whenever we have some abilities, it is not just our ability. It is it is Krishna who is gifting us those abilities. So if we are grateful when ability manifests through us, then we can be graceful when ability doesn't manifest through us. It is not our ability. It is Krishna who is manifesting. So if I am grateful when it happens, then okay, when it doesn't happen, I don't feel it's the end of my world. So it's, I can still be graceful. I had those strengths. They came from Krishna. I don't have those strengths, but still I have Krishna. So it's it's important that when we are in a relatively in a situation of having material strengths, to be conscious that the strengths come from Krishna. I just wrote a Gita Devi article today before I came here. That's why I got late. It's like we are all birds on branches. Now a bird doesn't live in fear that the branches may break. Because branch may break because it has its wings. But if the bird's wings, if the baby bird's wings not developed, then if the branch falls, it will crash. So, so we are our wings. We are like birds. Our wings are our attraction for Krishna, our devotion for Krishna. So right now we are sheltered in the branches, and we know to eat those branches. But we can't let these branches become our permanent shelter. We have to see these branches, whatever it is, it may be our financial situation, our social situation, our health situation. If it is good, we see that it's, it's, it's a shelter for me and I, I need it, but it is not for settling down comfortably into material life. It is for preparing myself for spiritual life. So that eventually when the branch breaks, I can fly at least to the next branch. And then again to the next branch, to the next branch. And eventually, I'll fly into the sky to Krishna. So when we are in that situation of strength, at that time, we need to value people around us and we need to value Krishna. Then we can protect ourselves. We'll talk one day. Yeah. We'll talk one to one. Don't mind. What? So thank you very much. Shri Prabhupada ki Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki Jai Gaur Shri Manante Jai